Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, practical machine learning and Rails. Uh, I'm Andrew Cantino. I'm the VP of Engineering at Mavenlink. And this is Ryan Stout. He's the founder of Agile Productions. And I've been doing machine learning off and on for a couple years since I studied it in grad school. And Ryan's been doing it basically full time for the last year for an upcoming project. So we're going to split this talk in two, and I'm going to sort of do a theoretical introduction to machine learning, giving you a sense of what it is and why you should care about it. And then Ryan's going to do a bunch of examples. So uh, this talk will introduce machine learning and give you guys a sense of why it's important and why I think you should bring it to your projects. I want to make you machine learning aware, by which I mean that when you go back to your companies and your startups and you encounter problems that machine learning would be a really good asset for, I want you to know what tools are available to you and have a sense so you can just sort of dive in and at least know what, is, know what exists and not be scared to try these techniques when you have problems where they'd be a good fit. And then we'll give a bunch of examples. This talk will not give you a PhD. Uh, machine learning is an enormous field, and people get PhDs in very small parts of it. Um, we're not going to actually implement any algorithms. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple algorithms at a high level and give you a sense of how you would use them, but we're not going to dive into the implementation details. And we're not going to cover collaborative filtering or optimization, clustering, advanced statistics, et cetera. It's a very large field. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is many different algorithms that predict data from other data using applied statistics. At its core, machine learning is applied math. But there's a lot of libraries available that abstract that math away from you. Machine learning is not magic. You can only predict what's, what's actually there. So I said it's data. What data? Well, the web is made of data. APIs, logs, click trails, user de decisions, all of these things are data that lives in your SQL or NoSQL database. And you can use to, to, you can analyze it, and you can make predictions from it using machine learning. Your users leave trails of smelly data wherever they go. And you can, uh, you can do things with this. So we have data. What do we do with it? Well, we classify it. Classification is breaking things down into categories and given some new data, trying to figure out which category it should fall into. So is it spam or ham? We want your inbox to be full of ham, not spam. Is it appropriate or inappropriate? Is it happy or sad? And you could also have other categories. So you could say, is it angry, hateful, loving, teaching, inquisitive, et cetera? And that's an example of sentiment analysis. And Ryan's actually going to give a work through an example of that in a few minutes. There's other things you could classify as well. So you could classify documents. You could classify documents by sorting them the way Gmail's importance filter does. You could classify them by routing them the way Aardvark does with questions. You can categorize them the way Amazon and just about everyone else does with reviews. You could also classify things about your users. For example, their expertise, or their interests, or their pro versus free, or their likelihood of actually paying you, or their expected future karma on your new social networking site. And you could classify events, like logs, or logins, or clicks, based on abnormal versus normal, for example. You could make a system that automatically detected if there was an intrusion, or if something just looked out of whack. You could, you could classify links, make, make a system that, you know, before you clicked on a link, warned you if you were about to get rickrolled. So I hope I've convinced you that classification is useful and that it's likely that you'll encounter problems where this is something you would want to do. Um, I want to talk about a couple algorithms you could use to do that. So the first algorithm is dec decision tree learning. Um, and what I like about decision trees is they're really straightforward. They're basically just flowcharts. So here's an example decision tree, which would classify a new email into whether or not it's spam. And those are the labels, spam or ham, and by using features of that email. For example, the presence or, the, of, or absence of the word Viagra, or the presence and absence of the words Ruby, or how many attachments it has. Now, presumably, this decision tree wasn't actually written by a person. This is a hypothetical tree that was learned off a corpus of data. And the way you could do this is you could figure out which feature best divides your data into these two categories, like you were playing 20 questions. You start with the highest level feature that has so-called the highest entropy and best divides your data. So in this case, presumably Viagra best separated the spam from the ham. 
So given a new email, we then say, well, does it have the word Viagra? And if it does, does it have an attachment? And if yes, then the probability it's spam a priority from this corpus is 95%. And without that attachment, I guess it was 70%. And without the word Viagra, and instead the word Ruby, it was 5%. Or without Ruby, it was 10%, which must be our baseline probability in this corpus. And when I, I keep saying corpus, and what that is, is your, that's your training set, or your, your data of knowledge that you're studying. So it, it's your database. So, so anyway, um, decision trees can be learned, and there's algorithms for learning them. I'm not going to go into the details of how you actually do that, but, and, but Ryan's, the library Ryan's going to introduce would, it has that technique built in. So another algorithm you can use is called support vector machines. And support vector machines are a modern algorithm. Um, they're good for basically any sort of classification that has fewer than uh, maybe 2,000 features. So when you classify documents, you often treat every word as a feature. And we'll talk about that in a second. And in that case, support vector machines don't always work that well. Um, they can use a lot of memory and be slow in that case. But for anything smaller, they work very well. So in this example, imagine the black dots are spam and the white dots are ham. And what we're doing is we're trying to find a line that best separates these two classes. And these, the axes here are two hypothetical features, like the number of times the word Viagra appeared, for example. And in the real world, this would actually be a very high dimensional space with thousands, you know, 500 axes. But either way, what support vector machine's doing is they're figuring out a line that maximizes the margin between these two classes. Um, and at a high level sense, that's all they're doing. They're actually, it doesn't have to be a line, it can be a curved surface and called a kernel, but this is basically what they do. And there's a library called libsvm, which you can use, and has Ruby bindings um, to use this technique. Now, I said that support vector machines don't work. They work OK for text, but they're not great for various reasons. One algorithm that does work quite well for text is called Naive Bayes. And now, Naive Bayes actually works sort of frustratingly well, because it's really simple. Um, and it becomes this baseline that other more advanced techniques have to beat. So the way it works is you break every document down into words, and you treat every word as an independent feature. And in this case, I mean independent in a statistical sense. So the probability of any two words co-occurring is, is the same for all words. It's basically random. Now, that, that clearly isn't true, because the word Viagra and the words Canadian pharmacy tend to occur together. But even if you pretend that it is true, it's still, or, you know, even if you make that assumption, it still does very well. So it's surprisingly effective on text, and it works well when you have a lot of data and a lot of features. We, in this case, features are words. So let's work through a very quick example, just so you have this, you can have an intuitive sense of how this works, and also so you get a sense of how you actually could implement this. So imagine you had a corpus of 100 emails, 70 of which were spam, which is unfortunately pretty accurate. Um, now you could divide that corpus up based on how many times these words occur in those emails. So, and this is hypothetical, but we could say Viagra occurred 42 times in spam and only one time in ham. Ruby occurred seven times in spam and 15 times in ham. And hello occurred 35 times in spam and 24 times in ham. And then we also have the percentages, which you can think of as probabilities. So 60% of the spam emails had the word Viagra, so you can think of it as a 60% chance that a new spam email is going to have the word Viagra. Now, you can combine this using something called Bayes' rule. And I'm not going to go into the details of how it's derived, but it's not a particularly complicated formula. And what it says is you can estimate the probability of a new email being spam based on this table that you already have. So you say, and the, re the way you read this equation, is the probability that this new email is spam, given, that's the bar, given that it has the words hello and Viagra, equals the probability of spam overall, which is 7 out of 10, 70% times the probability of the words hello and Viagra occurring in a spam email, which we know from this table is 0.5 and 0.6, divided by the probability of these words occurring at all in your corpus, which is just, just under 0.6 and just over 0.4. So you can see how you get these statistics from this table, which is basically just a histogram or a lookup table on your data. But you multiply that through, and magically you find out that the probability of this new email being spam is 82%. Now, this is just with a couple features, a couple words. But if you do this with a lot of words, it does, it does very well. And this is the basis of most spam filters these days. Um, and there's some filtering techniques and stuff you can use to make this work even better, which I'm not going to go into. But as you can see, this is something you could actually just type out in your Ruby code. You could, you could implement this. And there are gems that do this. So that's naive base. 
Um, the last algorithm I want to mention is neural nets. And I partly want to mention them because you've probably all heard of them, but you may not know how they work. Um, and I want to sort of warn you away from them in a lot of sense, because support vector machines do a lot better, and they're a lot easier to deal with. So neural nets have an input layer, a hidden layer, or more than one hidden layer, and an output layer. And neural nets are good in a lot of ways. They're, they're modeled after how the human brain works, at least at a very high level. Um, so they're aesthetically appealing. But they're very hard to understand. You end up with these different weights on the inner nodes that you just can't interpret. Um, and they're, they're, provably, they're provably complete. It's been shown that with, uh, with enough hidden layers, they can fit any function, including a discontinuous function. But they have a lot of caveats. So anyway, the way this works is the input, uh, the input layer takes feature values, for example, the, number, the currents counts of words or the colors of pixels that are often used on images. The hidden layers fill, take those values from the input layers, usually fully connected, as you can see here, and apply a, a threshold, more or less, on those values, and apply a function to each one of those values summed up. And then that goes through, propagates through some number of hidden layers, and finally it goes to the output layer, which gives you a classification. Either if it's above 0.5, it's spam, and if it's below that, it's ham, for example. And then there's an algorithm you can use to train these to fit your data. But they have a tendency to overfit the data, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it's sort of black magic how you pick how many hidden layers to have, how many nodes, et cetera. But they can be, they can be kind of good for processing images sometimes. So anyway, I wanted to talk about them briefly to give you a sense of what they are and maybe to steer you away from them towards support vector machines instead. So I want to cover two sort of high-level concepts before I pass off to Ryan to do some examples. Uh, the first is called curse of dimension dimensionality. And the basic idea is the more features and labels you have, the more data you need. So and again, features here are words or characteristics of your users. And I, maybe I didn't talk enough about what features are. Like in our spam example, it doesn't just have to be words. It could be who the email's from or the Google page rank of that domain or the number of images attached. Those are all features of your data. So the more features you have, clearly the more information you have, the more, the more data you need to learn, to learn a classifier which is fairly intuitive, because if you have a number line, that represents one feature. And to fill it out, you need sort of n data points. But if you have two features, now you have a surface, and you need n squared data points. Three features is a volume, and you need n cubed data points, and so on. Now, this isn't completely true, because any smart algorithm is going to not need to fill the entire volume of this, this possibility space. Um, you can you know, support vector machines and other systems sort of learn a, a curve through that space. But nonetheless, it's roughly exponential in the number of features. And that's one thing to keep in mind. You'll need a lot of data. The other thing I want to talk about is overfitting. The basic problem is that with enough parameters, anything's possible. So and in this case, parameters are sort of dimensionalities of your algorithm. So with neural nets, it would be the number of hidden nodes. With support vector machines, it's the number of what are called support vectors, data points. But basically, it's the amount of memory that you give to your algorithm. So you, you don't want your algorithm to memorize the data you're giving it. You want it to generalize sort of interesting characteristics of that data. So you want to generalize, not memorize. And so there's this trade-off between giving your algorithm enough parameters that it can learn the characteristics you want it to learn without giving it so many that it just memorizes everything. And there, so what we do to avoid this is we test on different data than we train. So you have a corpus. And you want to make sure you test on a different part of the corpus than you train on so that you can sort of average away any biases that are in your data and prevent your algorithm from, from over-memorizing or overfitting. Um, you don't actually need two data sets. You can do what's called cross-validation, where you take one data set and you divide it into, say, 10 pieces. And then on one you train on 9 tenths of it and you test on 1 tenth. Then you do that 10 times on all the different slices and average. And that's called cross-validation. And that's sort of the standard approach to prevent or at least gauge how much overfitting you've had. So before I pass to Ryan, I want to mention one other thing, which is your algorithm is going to tend to learn the simplest thing it can or key off of any biases that are in your data. And a classic example of this is that the army wanted to detect tanks that were hidden in trees. So they gave some scientists 100 pictures of tanks in camouflaged in trees and 100 pictures of just trees. And the scientists, they knew what they were doing. They knew how to cross-validate. So they build a neural net classifier. And it worked very well, and they thought their biases were gone because they were cross-validating. And they gave it back to the Pentagon and said, go blow up some tanks. And it didn't work. So they, you know, they came back to the scientists. And what they figured out was that all the pictures of 
tanks and trees had been taken on cloudy days. And all the pictures of just trees had been taken on sunny days. And so they had evolved a cloud detector, not a tank detector. <laughs> and, and this happens a lot in machine learning. It's really hard to know what all your biases are in your data and figure them out. So you just need a lot of data from a lot of different scenarios before you really believe that it's learning the right thing. Um, and with that, I want to pass off to Ryan. Yep. All right, can everybody hear me? All right, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit, go through a couple examples for you. I know when I was uh, first getting into this, I watched a bunch of videos online about machine learning, and you know everything was a bunch of math I didn't understand in college. So, <laughs> so I, I think one of the, the most helpful things is actually to see what does this look like when you actually want to sit down and go through this, because typically, if you want to use machine learning to get started, you're not going to be implementing your own algorithms because, again, there is a lot of math behind it. But there's some great tools out there to kind of get you off the ground quickly. So for the first example, I want to talk about sentiment classification. And for anyone who's not familiar with this, it's also called sentiment analysis. And this is where you have a block of text and you want to know, is it positive or negative? And companies will use this. They'll search for their product name on Twitter, for example. And they'll see how many people are talking positively about it, how many people are talking negatively about it. And they can kind of get a metric into how well they're doing with their product. So to go about this, first what we need to do is get what's called a training set. And in this example, we're going to use tweets from Twitter. And then the tweets, we're going to have the text from the tweets and whether it's positive or negative. So we could just go and download you know, uh, 10,000, 20,000 tweets off Twitter and then label them by hand as being positive or negative. But that sounds like a lot of work. So I would propose instead that what we do is use emoticons, the you know, smiley faces and frowny faces, as the labels. And so we'll, we'll just search directly for tweets with the happy smiley face and the frown face. And then we'll remove those from the tweet, and we'll use that as the label, as being positive or negative. So here's, here's some examples. I've taken out the tweets, uh, or I've taken out the um, emoticons. But you can kind of see, generally, if you're searching by, by the emoticons, you get a pretty good example of negative and positive tweets. So, and if you can't see that, um, it's just examples of, of what these tweets look like. So once we have the text from the tweets and the labels, we need to extract what are called features that the algorithms can use, because we can't just feed the text directly into the algorithms. So in this case, we're going to use what's called the bag of words model. And the bag of words model is a way of dealing with text and converting it into features that is fairly simple. It actually ignores things like sentence structure, grammar, word order. And it's really just looking at what are the words that occur in, these, in, this, in this text. So the way you go about converting text into the bag of words model is by splitting it into words, and then you create a dictionary of all the words that occur in all of your training examples. And then typically, you'll keep a certain number of those. So you might say, I want a 10,000 word dictionary, and you'll throw away all the ones that weren't in the top 10,000. And you'll use those as your dictionary words. And then lastly, you'll replace that text with the counts in the dictionary position. So let me show you what that looks like. So if you have these three tweets, this is a really small training set. If you had, I ran fast, Bob ran far, I ran to Bob, you end up with a dictionary that looks like this. So these are all the words that occur in our training set. You have, I ran fast, Bob, far too. Those are all the words. So then what we do is we go back to our tweets and we we take the dictionary, the offsets in the dictionary, and replace the count of each of those words into an array. So you can see here, if you look at the second example, Bob ran far. Bob is, uh, Bob is the fourth word in the dictionary, so there's a one in that position. And everything else ends up being a zero. And if we had more than, if, if a word occurred twice, you'd have a two there, for example. So that gives you word vectors. And we can take those word vectors and the labels and then feed them into our classification algorithm, which I'll talk about in a second. And then the classification algorithm spits out what's called a model that we can then query with new examples we haven't seen, and it'll give us predictions. In this case, predictions of whether it's positive or negative. So to actually go and do this, I'm going to use an open source tool called Weka. 
Um, it's a Java app. Uh, don't hold that against it. It, uh, it contains a bunch of common machine learning algorithms. And it's really nice for getting a feel of what the different algorithms do and kind of what their advantages, disadvantages are. It gives you nice visualizations into the parameters. Has a GUI interface, which is easy to get started with. And since it's written in Java, we can access the, the library side of it from JRuby. So one other thing I like about Weka, it helps with converting words into word vectors, which I just talked about. And it also helps with, as Andrew mentioned, training test, um, building a training test set to prevent overfitting, doing cross-validation to prevent overfitting. And then it also gives you all of these metrics to see how well you're doing. So to actually get started with this, if you're, if you're going to start, I recommend just going with the GUI interface. And we can, we can get our data into the GUI interface with what's called an R file. And an R file is very similar to a CSV file. It just has a little bit more header information to tell you uh, things like the columns and what, what the types are on those. So let me show you real quick. I'm going to jump into Weka here. And so, so if you, when you open up Weka, you'll see, you'll see this. It's got this little interface. And you can go to the Explorer is the, probably the best place to start. And once you're there, I recommend you can open a file and you want to browse to, to your R file. And I'm going to assume here that we've already made an R file. So I'm going to open that. And this R file has two columns in it. It has the tweet, which is a string, and it has the class, which is of uh, the type is called nominal, which means it's got multiple options. It's kind of like an enum. Um, so, so what we need to do here is, as I mentioned before, we need to take this tweet, which is a string, and we need to get it into the word vectors. So the easiest way to do this in Weka is to browse to the filters. You can go to unsupervised, attribute, and then there's this string to word vector. And this is a nice helper to kind of, again, get everything into, into the word vector format. So if I click, I can open up this options panel. And you can see it's got all these options. And just to start off with, at the bottom, there's a word, words to keep. And this is your dictionary size that I was talking about before. So we're going to leave it at 1,000. That's a little small, but it'll, it'll work in this example. We're going to lowercase all the tokens. And then because class is over here, we need to add a prefix to all of these so that they don't conflict with class. So I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to hit Apply. And it's going to take tweet, and it's going to break it up. It's going to split it by words and then give us word counts on every example for every word. So you can see here, actu the word actually appears uh, in 153 examples. So you can kind of get some visualization into that. So once you have that, once we have all these word counts, we want to go over the classify tab, and then we need to select our label here. And so our label is called class, which, and this is positive or negative. And then we're going to go up to classifier. And if for some reason it's cut off. Oh, boy. All right, one second. Um, so anyway, Weka gives you a bunch of different, a bunch of different examples, uh, classifiers that you can use. And normally you can see it. <laughs> Uh, and we're going to use what's called liblinear. And liblinear is it's built on support vector machines, but it's what's called a linear model. So it can handle quite a bit more features in our case. In, in our case, we only did 1,000 words, but this could go up to 100,000 words pretty easily. So I'm going to hit Start. And since we have cross-validation selected for our testing options, what it's going to do is it's going to take a look at all the data, build a model, and then it's going to build 10 more models, each time holding out 10%. And so it's going to take that 10% that it held out, and it's going to see how well would it have predicted with the 90% model, how well would it have predicted the 10%. And so this is really useful because it gives you an idea. It's able to use most of the data and yet give you an idea of kind of what the main model is going to do, how well it's going to perform. So right off the bat, you can see we did 76%. I think that's pretty good for only for only doing 1,000 words uh, and not doing any other advanced techniques. So, so that kind of gave us a, good, a pretty good model with not a lot of work. So uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the, the metrics that Weka gives you. 
when you're doing classification, the, the one that's most useful is the number of correctly classified instances. Because if all you care about is did it guess positive or negative correctly, that's what you want to look at. If you're doing what's called regression, which is where instead of trying to predict a class, you're trying to predict a number based on some input, then you would look at things like mean absolute error and mean squared error, and those will tell you how far away was it from, from, one, uh, from the actual value. And the mean squared error is useful because it, it doesn't take direction into account. So it's just kind of how far away was it from, from where it should have been. Also, if you have what's called an unbalanced data set, which say, for example, we had 10,000 positive examples and only 1,000 negative examples, and this is actually pretty common in machine learning where you can't get enough examples of a certain type, but there's value in, in kind of saying, well, it's not this, for example. Uh, if you have that unbalanced data set, you'll want to look at what's called the confusion matrix, which is probably the most intimidating name for a metric I can think of. And you want to look at that, and it'll tell you how many did it guess in each class. So the value of this is the machine learning algorithms are smart in that if you had 90% of one class and only 10% of the other, the algorithm would figure out it could always guess the 90% class and get 90% right. So looking at the confusion matrix will show you things like your false positives and your false negatives and give you an idea of, of, how, that, of how well it's doing there. If you're curious, I have an example here of training this directly from, from JRuby. And this is a Rails project that you can check out. It also has the querying interface as well. So if, you, if you're curious, you can take a look at this project and load it up. It's got a pre-trained model in there. But you can take a look at that and then see kind of what's this look like if I wanted to train it directly from, from my Java code or my JRuby code. So, so one, one other thing let me show you real quickly. It, once we have this, sorry, once we have this model, we could actually just click, right click on it and hit save model, and then we can query that directly from, from our JRuby code. And one thing that you'll want to do though is if you actually go to do that, you'll want to take the pre-processing step of converting the words into word vectors, and instead of doing that, you'll want to select, um, there's what's called meta, meta classifiers. And so there's one under here called, uh, what is it called? Filtered classifier. And this will let you pick what classifier you want to use. And then you can also do your word vector conversion here so that when you query, you can pass in text directly and it'll happen as part of that step. So let me show you what the, query, what the querying looks like. It's actually pretty simple. So basically, we load up the R file that I talked about earlier. And then we load that model that we saved. And you can either save it, again, from the GUI interface, or you can write JRuby code to, or Java code to, to actually do the training. And then we load up what's called a data set. And this is kind of all of the things that were in the original R file. And then when we have our new data, say we have a new string and we want to see is it positive or negative, we create what's called a sparse instance. We set the attribute value. And in this case, there's only one attribute, and that's tweet. And we set that to the text. And then we can call on our classifier, we can call distribution for instance. And this will give us the percent likelihood that it is each class. So it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. And I think kind of hopefully seeing this will give you, give you an idea of kind of how accessible some of this stuff is. Um, and you, know, you, you, don't, you don't really, it, it's useful, obviously, to understand the math. But you can get started without, without kind of understanding that. So, so how do we improve? We got 76%. Um, obviously, it could be better. So there's a couple, couple easy ways to improve. One is having a bigger dictionary. That'll improve it quite a bit. Another one is using what are called bigrams and trigrams. And this is specific to when you're dealing with text. So, so in our example of the bag of words model, we only used one word at a time. And there was no sort of correlation between words. So with bigrams, for example, instead of just taking each word individually, if you had a, a phrase like, the cat ran out the door, you'd take the words in pairs. So you'd, you'd have the cat, cat ran out, ran out, and so on. And you take each of those as combinations and feed them as if they were words. So the, the benefit there, especially with English, is that the bigrams will pick up on negations. So if you say, I don't like something, in the single word bag of words model, don't might count against it being positive, and like might count it being four. 
But in, in, the, in the bigram model, you'll have don't like, and it'll know that that's a negative. So that's useful. You could also do part of speech tagging. There's quite a few systems out there that will take, look at your text and say, this is a verb, this is a noun. And then you can treat those as different tokens in the bag of words model. So that's valuable because some words might have, might count positively if they're a noun, and some might count negatively if they're an adjective or something like that. And lastly, having more data it will help this. And that's where having a way to get data without hand labeling it is always useful. So I want to talk a little bit about feature generation. And in this last example, our feature generation was just getting things into the bag of words model. And we're using the bag of words model for our features. But there's a lot of examples where you're doing things where you're actually going to want to think about how to go get more data to make features that are useful. So, so one, thing, one thing you want to do when you're in that situation is kind of ask yourself, what information would be valuable to an expert in this field? So say you're trying to predict housing prices. You might go to a realtor and say, what do you look at when you're, when you're trying to come up with the, the price of a house? And they might come back and say, oh, square footage, number of bathrooms, whatever. And then you'd go and, and make those into features. Another thing you want to do, and this goes back to the curse of dimensionality that Andrew was talking about, is if you have a limited amount of data, and you almost always do, it's hard, it's, there's tons of data out there, but it's hard to get the right kind of labeled data that you need for classification. You'll want to go and actually remove the data that isn't useful. And, and the reason for this is then you can, get more, you can get more value out of the data you have. So, so this process is called attribute selection. Let me show you real quick. There's, it, Weka actually makes this pretty simple. So if we have our, if we have our, our words here, we can go to the Select Attributes tab. We want to pick, pick our label class, which is class. And then you could select from all these different attribute evaluators. So we could do um, this info gain one I like. And we could select that and then run it. And what you'll get is you'll get a screen that looks like this. And in, in this example, since all of our features are words, it's going to return the words in order of how valuable they are to predicting our classes. So you can see here, there's kind of the, the ones you'd expect, sad, good, love, hate, things like that kind of come up to the top. So, so if you had this and you had a bunch of features, you could go to the bottom of the list and say, these features I can probably remove. And if you took them out, you'll, you'll most likely see an increase in, in quality. Although with, with text, it, it can vary. Um, but especially in other examples, you'll, you'll see the value kind of go up. So, so let me go through another example. This is one that I've been working on. Uh, say you have a domain name and you want to predict what's the value of that domain name. This is actually a really, kind of a really hard problem to solve, I think. But what, what would be the process that y you as a feature engineer would go through to kind of figure out, to create a thing to predict the price of domain names? So, so what I've done is you create a training data set that consists of domain names and the historical sale prices for the domain names on the domain name resale markets. So, so once we have that, we have the prices, and we kind of have accurate prices for the value of domain names. We need to, to figure out features from the domain names that we can feed into the classifier. So what I, what I would suggest is you could split the domain into words, because that's kind of where the value comes from, is what words are in the domains. And then you could generate features for each word. So the, the features I would suggest, and that I, I've seen used that work, is you could look at like how common the word is, the number of Google search results for the word, for example. And the one that's also valuable is if you, you could use the Google AdWords API to figure out what the cost per click to advertise on that word is. And those kind of give you value, the value of the individual words. And then what you do is say, say you wanted to feed those in as features. You might say, OK, we're, we're just going to assume there's a max of three words. We're going to take these three features from each word and feed them in as numbers and create an array out of that. So if you only had one word, you'd have the three values here and then zeros for the rest of it. And if you had three words, you'd have the values in for each of them. Does that make sense? OK. So, so once we have all, uh, those nine features, for example, we'd feed those into a regression algorithm, like I mentioned a minute ago. And the one I'd recommend, there's, there's a couple implementations of what's called support vector regression. And this is similar to support vector machines, except they give you, they give you a number instead of a class. So, I'm not going to go through that example, but um, that kind of gives you an idea of, of how you'd approach that. And I think, I think it's useful to kind of see. 
So again, as Andrew said, there's a machine learning is this massive field. So we, we kind of just covered a little, just a, a little glimpse of it. But a couple of things that you'll probably hear quite a bit are collaborative filtering, which is where you have associations between, for example, users and products. And you want to recommend new things based on how other people associate, other users associated themselves. So collaborative filtering can be really useful. This is how Netflix recommends movies, Amazon recommends products, things like that. Clustering is what's called an unsupervised learning technique. And this is where you feed in, data, you feed in features. And then the system will group the features based on some similarities. So you kind of have this system. You say, this is how I judge similarity. Group the ones that are most similar. And you'll get different groups up. So this is useful in things like grouping documents. Google News does this. They'll, they'll group all the news articles together to figure out which ones are the same or which ones are in different categories. You'll also see this in if you, you want to do related terms or related documents, things like that. And then lastly, there's kind of this whole branch of classical AI uh, and things called theorem proving that we, that we didn't really talk about. And you can ask Andrew if you have questions about that, because I don't really know a lot about that. <laughs> so so if, you, if you're interested in machine learning and you're looking for a good place to start and you kind of want to get into more of the, the underlying details, I'd highly recommend last fall Stanford did this machine learning class. And it's online, it's free, it's mostly it's just video content and some, some uh, kind of homework things you could do. This is, it's very useful, it's a big time commitment, but it gives you, it's, it gives you a really great uh, kind of intro to all of this, I think. And then talking about tools, and I think as, as Ruby developers, this is kind of where a lot of the value comes from. We, we mentioned Weka, Weka is useful, you can again query it from JRuby. There's also Ruby bindings, I think Andrew mentioned, for libSVM and liblinear. And these are both great libraries. One thing to keep in mind, though, is if you do use these, you won't get things like the metrics that Weka gives you. And you won't, you'll have to implement your own cross-validation and things like that. Now, that's not, it's not super hard to do, but it's you know, one kind of extra step. But I think typically my workflow is I'll kind, of, I'll kind of prototype things in Weka. And then I'll move them directly into libSVM or liblinear once I, once I kind of figure out how I want to do it. Another one I like is called Valpelwabbit. And this is out of Yahoo's research lab. And it's got quite a few different algorithms in it. But it, it's really useful. It's, it's very fast and can handle really, really large data sets. And it does have systems to kind of scale across multiple machines and things like that. So if you're working with things where you have a ton of features, Valpelwabbit's probably the way to go. Also, Recommendify, I haven't used personally, but I've heard good things about, is a collaborative filtering um, recommendation system that's, I think, written in Ruby, and you can use it as a gem. So just kind of wrapping up, hopefully this gives you kind of an overview of, of what machine learning actually looks like and kind of how to get started with it. And, and I would say, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a degree in this or anything. And, and I think it's, it's interesting because there's some really great resources now. And you really can just kind of go out and teach yourself all of these details. So feel free to contact us. Uh, these are our Twitter handles. And you can ask us questions if you see us around. So any, any questions? I see one in the back. Comment. The uh, Stanford classes now that the teachers of that have broken off into organizing some free groups and open online courses. One from Udacity and one from uh, Coursera. Yeah. Uh, the Udacity one, they're in the machine learning class of doing their self driving products. So these are okay. fabulous, serious classes. Just, just curious, did anybody do the, um, the machine learning class in the fall? So a couple people. I, I went through it, and I mean, I'd been doing this stuff for a little while, but I, I thought it was really, really well organized and kind of um, gave you a good intro into it. So any other questions? So uh, something like classification seems like domain specificity of the like, da data set yep. is really important. How important is domain specificity to sentiment analysis? Like, can I just grab uh, a million tweets from Twitter, you know, based on your smiley face mm -hmm. algorithm, and say, uh, you know, this collection of data represents <coughs> a model that represents sentiment, and then apply it to any domain and say, you know, uh, like a very specific domain. Say, I start actually looking for 
Um, like, for instance, I'm actually working on a machine learning project in the city of Chicago to do some sort of sentiment analysis with uh, the train system. And so, so can I say, here's a general concept of sentiment analysis, and then apply it with some sort of <coughs> ability to a specific domain you like? about the Yeah, so, so the question, if I, if I understand correctly, is, is kind of how well does your, if you have training sets in one domain, how well will that apply to other domains? Um, and I would say it, it is interesting, right? So, so I've done some stuff with sentiment analysis on Facebook. And it's tricky because you don't, people write differently in different situations. So Twitter is very compacted due to the, the, the limit. So you, you will run up against, um, some situations where it won't perform as well on data that's very different. Um, but, but I think in general, text is fairly standardized across all these different mediums. So when you're working with text, I've found it's pretty good. Uh, I I'd say if you could build the, the training set from whatever data set you're working with you know, to begin with, that'd be better. But at the same time, the Twitter Twitter's a good place because you can get so much data that it'll learn it, you know, it, it, the value of having more data probably outweighs the value of having domain-specific data. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I see back here. I'm sorry. Can you? Yes. So, um, yes. Yeah, so there's a couple things. So. So there's stimming is useful. There's what's called TF-IDF, which is kind of weighting um, the, the word bag of words model. Um, you can, both of those will, will help in a lot of situations. Um, given enough data, stimming isn't really necessary, um, but it it's, can still be useful, especially kind of it can lower your features. And there's a lot of, a lot of times with natural language processing, what I'll end up doing is I'll do a clustering algorithm to reduce the number of features down to something that can kind of be handled a little better. And then there's things like um, what's called LSA and LDA, which will give you a, a reduction in the dimension. It'll kind of cluster text to say, oh, these words all kind of mean the same thing. These words all kind of mean the same thing. And then you feed those together. And that's useful because then you'll get where someone might not have mentioned something exactly like what they want, but they'll, they'll figure, it'll figure out that they're talking about a similar thing. Yeah, you, you, you specify the number of topics, typically, is what it is. And then it'll, it'll kind of group those into that number of groups. So. So I think the question was, how would you extract substrings, basically feature extraction from text, like finding email addresses or addresses? Is that right? Um, I mean, there's a number of ways you could do that. You could train a classifier that gave you the probability that the next token is the beginning of an address, and the features were the previous set of tokens. And that would help you segment. You could do that for splitting words based on uh, single letters or sounds. Um, I also think something like a hidden Markov model might work well. but. Yeah, but um, maybe take it offline. I can chat with you. Uh, but I think you could come up with a feature set and using pure classification that would probably do fairly well using the stream of tokens. I haven't used it. Have you? Um, I, I looked at it a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think what you get with the Google Prediction API, and, and I could be totally wrong, so if anyone's here from Google, correct me, but I think they're kind of just bundling up support vector machines and, and some of these other classification systems. Uh, and and so, so I think, you know, it, it can save you some time and maybe scale a little better, um, but, I, but I don't know. It, to me, it's not hard to get going with this stuff, so I, I don't see a ton of value there, in my, in my opinion. All right, thanks everybody.